Uh, when Carlos invited me, it was uh, rather difficult to uh, choose something to speak about because uh, I don't want to really uh, talk about things that are already published that much, and uh, I would like to bring something that might potentially be useful. And what I came up with was this, the multi-level patterns. Uh, it is, in fact, published, and some of you may know about it, but since I've learned that there is still a kind of a, a rift between the, the MR, MIR community and, the, on the other hand, the psychological cognitive science uh, community, it might be that uh, it could be of interest to <coughs> Uh, for me to present this for you. If you, um, <laughs> you please cry out if, if you already know about it, then I will speak about something different. Uh, so anyway, just a, a little overview of what I work with these, these days. It's a, quite a wide range of areas at the present, and fortunately, all of these are, have been possible to combine in the main project that I'm working with right now, which is called Man Making Music. It's a twin study where we uh, address 32,000 twins uh, born 58 to 85, and we've um, asked them to fill in a web survey about a lot, a lot of things, including their early experiences of music and how much uh, they went to concerts and uh, practice instruments and so forth and what kinds of influences they had. And the main idea about the pr project is to um, address relations between engage involvement in music and physical and, and uh, psychological health, which is, and, and that particular slant is probably what uh, gave us the funding for the project. But there are many other issues of more basic research character that we can address with this uh, huge survey because we include lots of measures of uh, intel for example of motivation intelligence personality factors and so forth but that's just a general information i should also just point out some of the work i've been involved in uh, i don't expect you to read this i just want to show that there are whatever there are nine publications of recently the three topmost of these publications are outcomes from the twin project uh, the third from the top, for example, presents what might be of interest to you as well, a uh, musicality, a test of musical ability, where, which consists of three components, uh, discrimination of melodic discrimination, pitch discrimination, and rhythm discrimination. And in, in addition to presenting that test in the article, we also show that these abilities are uh, quite heritable from about 20 to 50 percent heritable. What I've been doing for less recently is rhythm and timing research, and this is just a list of things that have to do with rhythm, and in particular groove, which I started to become interested in in 2001. And uh, with the help of, uh, in recent years, uh, George Soros and uh, Matthew Davis, who are at the conference, and also Fabien Guillaume at Ines Porto, we've been able to uh, perform a, um, shall we say, um, incremental series of experiments, beginning with uh, a level close to the musical material with real music, uh, which helped us form some, some hypothesis uh, from which we could uh, make very firm or precise hypothesis and test that with synth synthesized musical material in a few experiments, and uh, two of these were recently published in a special issue of the Frontiers in Psychology, for which I was guest editor. So enough of the background, and <coughs> now to the main issue um, of the multiple level patterns. So if you imagine a generic metrical grid like this, we have the fastest events here, da 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 and you can imagine uh, the next metrical level to be represented by da, 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 and da, 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 and so forth. This uh, figure has room for six levels uh, when we have only this long, <coughs> this long sequence. And, and this, I'll get back to why I was interested in producing a generic pattern like this uh, in a moment, but for now, 
uh, I'd like to say that the uh, a difficult part in doing so was to come up with the, in hindsight, very simple idea of replacing these uh, imagined different voices in the musical uh, pattern <laughs> simply with uh, different loudnesses. So if you consider loudness on the, on the left axis here, you have patterns that sound like the one you heard before. And uh, I, I'm trying to stop this sound now, but it doesn't work. Okay. Because that was just, that was sufficient. So, I am, um, now I want to uh, rather quickly go through four different examples of how this basic uh, pattern can be employed uh, for a number of psychologically uh, interesting questions. First, uh, the issue of personal or spontaneous tempo, which one is, has to do with production, what people prefer to, to do with is simply ask to, ask to play a regular beat that seems uh, to be in, a, in an optimal tempo for them. This, um, and the other is the perceptual variety where people judge when they listen to different isochronous uh, beats to judge which is the most pleasant to listen to. And this has been addressed with metronome-like patterns and with rhythmic patterns, uh, typically patterns with two metrical levels where the idea is to change the tempo and see which of the two metrical levels people prefer to synchronize with as an index of the preferred tempo, personal tempo. So if we go back uh, to this pattern, it's, you can easily see that there are many, many levels at the same time that it, it is possible to entrain to or to tap along with. So we have all these different, uh, by, by a power of two uh, time intervals that you can choose from. So I simply presented um, participants with these patterns in 13 different tempi that you can <coughs> see along, along the x-axis here. So the smallest interval was from 22 milliseconds and incremented up to 91. And then I had two uh, very, very much longer intervals as well, just to see what, what would happen there. So participants, uh, were exposed to these patterns one after one uh, several times and were asked simply to tap along. And the lines, which you see here, the black lines, they are, they are identical in all these graphs and they simply show what the inter-tap intervals would be for that particular metrical level. So here is the fastest metrical level, me the second higher, the third and fourth and so on. And the little squares and triangles are simply the means of uh, that particular individual's interonset intervals when tapping along with this. So what can be seen from this rather busy picture with many participants, 15, uh, 12 participants, is that there is a fair amount of individual differences in this task, which is what has been shown before as well. Uh, for example, this person uh, tends to synchronize with very long intervals with the very high metrical levels, and this one over here tends to prefer the very short ones, but there is variability. So if we combine all these results in one single graph, it looks like this. So for example, the, the longest IOI here occurs uh, at four different places here, 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 and here for the four different metrical levels. And we can see that the uh, absolute majority of all the responses among these 12 participants occur in the interval in the box here between 400 and 800 milliseconds. And uh, the interesting point for this result, which is unpublished as yet, by the way, is perhaps that when compared with one level, one metrical, one level metrical, like a, a metronome pattern, uh, the preferred tempo tends to be around 500 milliseconds, and here it is, well, some 30, 50% higher, simply because of the 
I would say because of the nature of the pattern, where you have all these levels available at the same time, it increases the density in the signal, for example, and it makes it more, um, apparently that's what people do anyway. Uh, so the next example is um, of an application is based on the intuitive knowledge that we all have that if we have more metrical levels in a signal, it becomes easier to synchronize correctly with it. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, to, my, to my surprise, no one had seemed to have tested this experimentally before. So that's what I did. Again, employing uh, uh, different levels. But in this experiment, I ha had one condition with only one metrical level, one with two, whereas in the previous experiment, as you saw, I had all the, all the nine metrical levels present at, at once. And the question here was simply, uh, will synchronization accuracy increase with the number of metrical levels available in the signal? And, uh, yeah. So here we see, this is the, uh, the main interval, the one that they're supposed to synchronize with. It goes from a very optimal 527 milliseconds up to an extremely long three second interval. And the topmost graph shows what happens with only one level, the metronome example again. And um, <clears throat> it follows, and uh, what we see here is the percent, the percent variab variability in relation to the intransit interval to make it comparable uh, along the x-axis. Otherwise, we would have gotten a graph that increases very rapidly with the intransit interval. And uh, in consistent with previous research, there uh, it, it's pre fairly constant up to about one second, after which it becomes much more difficult and the variability starts to increase very rapidly with Again, only one sound every occurring every three seconds over here, or every two seconds over here. Once we introduce one level, so it sounds then you have help of the second more silent sound in between the two strong ones, and that corresponds to the squares, which you see here. So suddenly, not only does the variability uh, decrease, but it also becomes even smaller than over here. So apparently there's, it's a big help, and for three and four metrical levels even more, where we reach a level of 2% uh, percent variation, which is uh, much less than you would find for any unilevel metrical pattern or metronome sequence uh, synchronization. Now, of course, uh, in, in a way, this figure is misleading because it doesn't account for the intervening intervals, which is either two, four, or eight intervening intervals. So in the next graph, I present the same data according to that interval instead, to the Tatum, so to speak. And here we see, uh, again, the metronome thing over here increases as in the picture before. Here we see more closely what differs between the higher metrical levels applied. And we can see that for the four metrical levels, we reach the same low variability here for a shorter interval between the ten tatums than for the uh, three metrical levels. So there is uh, apparently uh, a, a rather complex interaction here between the number of metrical levels and the intransit interval. And I'm sure that musicians apply this intuitively, at least in their playing and composition. Are, how many of you are familiar with shepherd tones? Quite a lot, so I don't have to. But perhaps you haven't heard this uh, demonstration. The continuous one. trying to stop this thing. Uh, I okay, we have to do it this way again. Sorry, I shouldn't play any more music examples, apparently. I don't understand how it works. So, the silly uh, thought I had 
was simply this one. Um, and this, the multi-level pattern is ideal for doing this. And in fact, what I was going to come back to was that the reason I came up with it was to try to achieve this. I wanted to, to be able to lure people into feeling that the tempo was infinitely increasing. So all we have to do then is to, this is what happens in the patterns we've heard so far, or looked at. The, the intransitive interval is simply the base intransitive interval. But we can change them systematically as a, a, a function of their position in the sequence. So we decide on a sequence length, for example, 384 uh, events, or the double of that or something. And uh, that gives uh, a, a linear increase in this case and a geometrical increase in this case, which is, sounds more natural and which is which, what I uh, used in the following experiments, lower experiment. No, I, I won't play that. <laughs> Should I? Something like that. I, I couldn't follow exactly, of course, but what you see here, uh, the size of the dots is, again, the uh, loudness of the signal corresponding to the levels, metrical level zero, the fastest level, the next fastest level, uh, and so forth, three and four and six. And uh, plotted in a polar plot like this, you can see that if you double the tempo across one revolution of the pattern, it becomes the same in a way, or at least uh, by power of two. And, and that is useful if we want to link these patterns together. Uh, maybe I should start with this picture, uh, which um, shows loudness on the y-axis and the uh, sequence of events on the x-axis like this. And it's difficult to see, but what happens is that the the, the distance here is slowly increasing between the events. So the, they are becoming, it, the tempo is becoming slower according to the function you saw on the previous screen. At the same time as the loudness is systematically varied in a way that makes these aligned like this. Already five minutes? <laughs> okay. So what can happen in this, uh, if we, um, this is one pattern, this here, then it comes the next one repeated. And it is, well, I can't go into the details, but they are, uh, the loudness is aligned in such a way that people cannot hear the boundary between these patterns. And so they tend to follow, they jump in on an optimal level and tend to follow this, perhaps this way, or perhaps they do something like this, so they feel that it's becoming too slow and they switch to a faster level and go on like that. So one experiment was simply to see how far people will follow the subjective in the subjective tempo when this happens, this illusion, so to speak. And um, here we start with the, uh, this is, uh, I, I shouldn't go into, first tap, here, this is one, this is data from one person following several revolutions around like this. And uh, they start at a very fast tempo, go to a, a very slow one. Here switches to another level back and then follows all the way out to six, milli, uh, six seconds between the intervals. This is the graph for the other condition where the tempo increases instead. And this time people have a, a much more difficult time. They start here at a rather slow tempo, not that slow, and it becomes soon very difficult to maintain at 200 milliseconds, so they have to switch repeatedly like this. So, with this pattern, one can change the tempo and the speed of the tempo change by 
changing the length of the pattern. The re directional change, of course, it can be increasing and decreasing. And actually, many things can, uh, in, in addition to this, can be changed on the fly uh, directly if you want to. For example, the sounds. I've only used the same identical sounds in all the applications I've used so far, but it's, it's certainly possible to have different timbres, different kinds of sounds inserted in this. One can also make uh, changes in interaction with uh, a human operator following this pattern, for example, as a response of, to what the person does. And um, yeah, there are some reasons why this, this might be more useful than simpler patterns, because it's more biologically relevant, more ecologically valid, probably, since uh, it's more music-like, and uh, it gives you total control, according to point two, because as soon as you enter uh, some kind of music, there is some sort of structure there which might have some effect, and it usually makes experiments much larger in order to control for that. If you have one type of structure, you should probably contrast that to another a few other types of structures, structures to uh, make sure they don't have an effect in and of themselves. And it's more motivating. You can compare within the uh, pitch domain that ripple sounds and rich, timbre-rich sounds in general engage larger parts of the auditory cortex. And, uh, well, it's, uh, and our more natural probably work better uh, I see that as an analog to uh, the rhythmic, between the pitch and the rhythmic domain in this case, where this pattern is well, more richer, more natural, more ecologically valid, as I said before. And uh, just one little point is that when we work with no non-musicians, uh, it may be more motivating and uh, useful. Uh, thank you, Carlos, for inviting me and for the wonderful gang of MII. So MIR researchers, I've had the pleasure to work with. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, was your subject population from one country or ethnicity? or from several? No, well in this particular case, I think they were Swedes, all of them. From Sweden? Because mm. in the cultures I work with, uh, tempo is, uh, I say, feeling of comfort with tempo varies quite radically mm. from the adjacent cultures. Yes, well people are very flexible in this, and uh, I didn't mention it, but they weren't given any particular uh, instructions as uh, what to do. So if we would have done that, if I would have asked them to follow the tempo as, as long as possible, they w would certainly have behaved differently. Any other questions? I have one. I was wondering, is there any evidence uh, like from real music uh, performance uh, drummers and so on um, where some other effects create the illusion of, of speeding up? Mm. Yes, there, there seems to be an orchestral work uh, by a, a French uh, composer, I think. I don't remember the name right now, but there has been one or two attempts to implement this in real music, for sure.